doing some other thing and got, sorry I'm late. That's yeah. okay. It's good to see you. We're just kind of checking in. We have a, our, the youngest member of our Bible study is here. He's not interested in 1 Corinthians 6. He's interested in a book called I Am a Bunny. Uh, <laughs> and so mom steals a very good book. So we're, he's come to Bible study today. Um, and I am just sharing my screen for 1 Corinthians 6. Uh, and I want us to go back a little bit just to see how chapter 5 ended for us. Uh, chapter 5, remember, was uh, was about sexual immorality defiling the church. And one of the things we touched on that's going to be really important for today's study is this cultural clash that's going on. Uh, Paul has raised a devout Jew, as we know. He brags about it elsewhere in his letters that he is a Jew among Jews. He is uh, from one of the 12 tribes. He is from um, a school uh, called the Pharisees, which meant he was very learned in the scripture since he was a kid. He was such an expert that he was going around killing Christians. And his idea of the world from a Jewish point of view is going to clash immediately with the world's idea of what's going on. What I mean by that is he's, he's run now headlong as Paul is the, uh, the, the messenger, the prophet, the evangelist to the Gentiles. He's gone up into Greece, right? We know that he's outside Athens in a place called Corinth. He's traveled, and I can pull up a map if you like, but we know pretty much in our head, we look to him very frequently that Paul is, you know, he's from Tarsus, which is part of Turkey, right? And he, uh, he of course, founded churches in other parts of present-day Turkey, Ephesus, Colossa, um, Laodicea, and uh, in Corinth, he traveled, you know, of course, across the water to, um, to, uh, uh, to, to Corinth, which, as we remember, is this town that's situated on, on an isthmus, so you, you've got just a little bit of land that's four miles wide going to this huge bit of land that takes 200 miles to go around unless you will go across the four and a half mile isthmus. And that's how Corinth was founded, is it became the place where these travelers who wanted to go uh, over from places like Jerusalem, from places like Athens to Italy, uh, going from east to west, would need to go. And so Corinth then is this very secular, very popular city, uh, but it is Greek. And so as we get back to the screen uh, that I'm sharing with you, we see that um, uh, sexual immorality was something that was quite rife there because that was very Greek and very worldly. He's running against, he's running into these morals that he's just not used to running into. And so he talks to us and we studied this at length. We're not going to go into it again. We're just going to look at the last few verses because as we know, chapter and verse are not something that Paul had in mind when he wrote these, but were added by later editors who were very interested in making sure we could be all again on the same page. So verse 12 says, for what have I to do with judging those outside? Is it not those who are inside that you are to judge? God will judge those outside drive out the wicked person from among you. And Paul, as we pointed out last week, is, is of, of course upset with the sin and this guy who was, remember, he was uh, um, making house with his, um, his dad's wife. We assume his dad was no longer married to her. Um, and, but Paul was, of course, mad that that was going on, but he was even more upset that the church was not speaking up. And our lesson last week, as you remember, had to do with how you and I speak truth that's difficult, right? This church had a hard time saying, hey, you shouldn't be doing that. How many times do churches get, and other places, get, 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 just get used to stuff because they, they, they won't stand up to it? And how does God call us to stand up to things? So from there, we go into verse six, and we move into lawsuits among believers. And so I wonder if um, verses one through six, if Kitty, you want to give that a read for us. <clears throat> when any of you has a grievance against another, do not dare to take it to court before the unrighteous instead of taking it before the saints. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels to say nothing of ordinary matters? If you have ordinary cases, then do you appoint as judges those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to decide between one believer and another, but a believer goes to court against a believer and before unbelievers at that? Yeah. 
Let me pull up another web page and let's read this from Eugene Peterson's version because this has been very helpful, I think, uh, for us also as we've gone through um, uh, to read uh, his his take on it. Katie, I'll ask you to read that also in, in the message translation. Okay. And how dare you take each other to court? When you think you have been wrong, does it make any sense to go before a court that knows nothing of God's ways instead of a family of Christians? The day is coming when the world is going to stand before a jury made up of followers of Jesus. If someday you are going to rule on the world's fate, wouldn't it be a good idea to practice on some of these smaller cases? Why, we're even going to judge angels. So why not these everyday affairs? As these disagreements and wrongs surface, why would you ever entrust them to the judgment of people you don't trust in any other way? Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> what we're seeing again is another clash uh, between cultures here. Uh, Jewish law forbade arguments between Jews to be settled in secular courts. Okay, they just, it just never went. It, it was against Jewish law. You would never do that. And so Paul traveling up to you know, a secular area, a new church made up of Gentiles. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, the Greeks were renowned for, they, I mean, they were so litigious. Uh, they, you can go, go uh, back and read how they had, uh, you know, very uh, complex and extensive ways of settling their matters in public courts. They had, um, uh, you know, a first round that might be an arbitrator. They had a second round that might be a judge. They had a third round. Uh, in some writings say that the juries in some, some Greek cases of this era were made up of, of people in the thousands, right? That a case gets big enough and they would have 1,000, 2,000, 4,000 jurors in a case. I mean, I can't even imagine that. But this is to, to really highlight the point that, that this is a cultural clash going on. Uh, these Greeks are, are used to settling their, their cases in, in, in a secular courtroom. Uh, and Paul just can't believe that this is what you do. And the bigger point here, and what I, I hope we go a, a, away from this study with, is that Paul, as we, as we unpack this, gets into the idea that it is better to, um, it is, it is better to suffer a wrong than, than to fight for, um, for, for, than to fight for justice. Now, I know that sounds horrible to American ears, um, but <laughs> to suffer a wrong rather than do a wrong is, is, is the quote. To suffer a wrong than to do a wrong, okay? And Paul is saying, and you and I see this time and time again, um, you know, in, in, I, I've, been in, I, I've been in one lawsuit I can remember. I bought a car once and it was a lemon and I had paid a guy to look at it. And uh, the guy said, yeah, it's fine. Well, I drove it off the lot and literally one thing after another, by the third day it needed a new transmission, which was worth more than the car. <laughs> and so I went back to the dealer, I go, you know, come on. And they go, oh, no, sorry, you know. And, and so I, I was, of course, at the time married to a lawyer. And uh, she goes, well, you know, if you want to get your X thousands back, the only way is to take them to court. And so sure enough, I had taken the court, which meant that not only the, the accused, the owner of the um, dealership had to be deposed, but also that mechanic. And that mechanic was so, you know, like, like, like harmed by this. He, I remember he even came to the church after an eight o'clock service to confront me and to say, why are you suing me? And, and I, you know, he just couldn't get the fact that, well, you know, you told me the car was okay. The car was not okay. We got to get this returned and the money back. And it was such a horrible experience. I, um, I would almost have rather just said, you know what? I, I'll, I, it was just a lot of money to spend. It's your car, right? Um, but the harm that it did. And I think that Paul's edging up against this. He says, look, you know, what kind of reputation as a Christian minister am I going to now have with that mechanic, right? What kind of reputation am I going to have with that dealer, which I think that, that later that year went out of business. Um, but the, the idea is that the Christian witness is so important and bringing litigation against somebody causes such harm. Um, I, I can't, uh, I, I, I seriously would have trouble doing that again if I, I, I would have just rather have said, you know what, I learned my lesson. I should have, uh, you know, I, I, it's, it, this just happens sometimes. You go to a mechanic, they, they tell you that and kind of, kind of eat it. Um, of course, we get into that issue that I'm sure you all have faced when you, um, 
you, you confront somebody with a, a wrongdoing and, and they're convinced they didn't do anything wrong. Hey, I inspected the car, it was good enough. You know, they, and so you don't get the satisfaction of at least them apologizing, right? Um, but you do get, um, uh, you, you, you do cause irreparable damage by going to court and doing these things. And so, so let's take this verse by verse here. Let's, let's, take, let's take the share again here with, uh, with this. Um, so um, when any of you has a grievance against another, do you dare take it to court before the unrighteous instead of taking it before the saints? And one of the things that this, this really um, you know, highlights for me is this idea that uh, you know, the saints should have some sort of way of, of reconciling differences. Um, there should be some mechanism of, uh, you know, in the Episcopal Church, we do, Paul, uh, have a kind of a court, a tribunal, don't we? But that usually is there to, to uh, hear uh, cases of, of, of dirty priests or clergy who done things wrong. Um, we don't really have a court in which we could say, our, you know, bring arbitration um, that Paul is talking about. Uh, but, but his idea of it being really a stark um, difference between those who have secular uh, motives and those who have Christian motives. And so verse two says, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? So, you know, same thing there. Um, do you not know that you are to judge angels? Isn't that a curious uh, statement? Did you know you were to judge angels? Did you know that? Mm -mm. That's, that's kind of your job there. Yeah, you're going to be in charge there. Let's look at Peterson. Peter says, the day is coming when the world is going to stand before a jury made up of the followers of Jesus. Hmm. How about that for end times uh, theology, huh? Is that you are going to be judging, uh, uh, judging others. And, and uh, if someday you are going to rule on the world's fate, wouldn't it be a good idea to practice on some of these smaller cases? <laughs> Uh, why we're even going to judge angels, okay? So why not these everyday affairs? As these disagreements and wrongs surface, why would you ever entrust them to the judgment of people you don't trust in any other way? Um, have any of you ever kind of faced litigation or had to uh, go into court uh, for for some uh, uh, for some um, some cause? No, well, I'm in a case. No. Right. Anybody, been, anybody, been, anybody been on a jury? I'm yeah, sorry, they won't will you say something? No. I've been called several times, Pat, but never was seated. Yeah. Okay. I was on a okay. jury, and it was it was difficult because we had to make a decision yeah. and it held a young man's life in our hands mm. so that was a very very difficult time and at the point that i was on the jury kathleen was very little and all i could see is this young man and i could see kathleen and it, it, we had to put the practical and the evidence in front of us first before we could actually make a decision right. and talk it out. Mm -hmm. So yes, it was not, that's something I'd ever want to do again. And right. it taught me a great lesson about looking at everything before I say something. Mm. I don't always do that, but I mean, it, it mostly comes to mind. Right. Right, right. And, uh, but you, the fact that you remember this like decades later. Oh, yes. Yeah. It was almost 40 years ago. And do you remember deliberating wow. uh, with other people? Yes. Um, it, it, was a, it was a really good group in one way because we listened to each other. Um, there was a lot of uh -huh. patience in the room. So in hindsight, what I saw was God put us together to make this decision because we did listen. We listened mm -hmm. to the evidence. We listened to one another. We, uh, the listening part was the most important part. And then 
taking time to reflect on it. Um, we each had a few moments where we could go off by ourselves in the room, which is unusual. Um, they didn't really like that when they found it out, but that's all right. Um, yes, it, it's, it has stayed with me. Yeah. Yeah, it's not a it's not a it's not a great business. I mean, when I, I think of, of the practice of law and and Janet, you're married to a guy who does that, right? Janet, yeah, is your I, husband a lawyer by yeah. trade? Yes. Yeah. Semi retired and, now, but yes. Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry, and what? He, uh, I, I, and he has had I'm sure he has had his um uh, his share of stories to bring home to you. He has. The one interesting comment he made is after he handled a number of divorce cases, he said he would never want to be divorced. <laughs> so I thought that was good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we hope. Lost. We hope, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's tough. It's tough. Yeah, if your internet's kind of unstable, if you uh, if you go to um, if you hit your uh, audio only and not your picture, like put stop video, you might do better. Let's see, Susan, how are you doing? If I hit audio only, turn it off. Let's There we go. Yeah, um, I'm. Let's see. Let's see. Yeah, is uh, yeah. Funky the funky on here. Maybe. Sure. Let's see. I'm. So we should I, hit the stop I, I, Sometimes video. when the signal's bad. Uh, yeah, hit the stop video, and you can. Um, and then many okay. times you can. You know, because, yeah, you can hear better, yeah, when your internet's unstable. Janet, can you hear us okay. now? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, still kind of. Uh... Can you hear me? Okay, good. And Kitty, are you good? Yeah, yeah I can you hear can't you fine. Hear me? I... Yes. Okay. Yep, I can hear I can hear everybody. you fine, Janet. Okay. Isn't this funny? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then Kat, Pat, can you hear us? Yeah, I was having problems this morning. Yes. Were you? Okay, Pat can hear us. Paul, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear everybody fine. Okay, okay. All right, Susan, can you hear us? Yep. Okay, good. I'm going to stop everybody's video there and me. Yeah, we'll stop everybody's video and maybe that will help us weather whatever this is. Um, the, uh, yeah, this instability. I love it. Um, I love it. Anyway, in the uh, picture. that's too fun. There you go. There you go. I will start our, um, our, Video. Well, let's see. I, don't, I wonder if I. I wonder if I could share my screen, right, and still stop my video. There we go. So there we are on on uh, on the message and what what Peterson had to say. Uh, yeah. But see, I get this uh, bug that keeps coming up saying your internet connection is unstable, and so I worry that if I lose you guys, um, I'll I'll definitely start the meeting back up. But um, I, I don't know why. This has happened. It was fine yesterday, but as we know, it wasn't great on Sunday. So uh, anyway, back to lawsuits among believers, verse 7. Uh, Janet, do you want to read verse 7? All right. In fact, to have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud, and believers... Or law, oh, and believers at that. Okay. So this, this gets drills down to the point, doesn't oh, but it? I it is eight. better to suffer wrong, right? Yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. Seven and eight. 
Um, but this, this drills down, I think, to where we want to be um, about this idea of Christians are better to suffer wrong uh, than to do wrong. Um, and can you think of a time in your life uh, when you said, you know what, I'm just going to eat that. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to, um, uh, I'm not going to fight back. I'm not going to demand my rights. Um, you know, it, it, this is antithetical oh, to the sure. world, which is why it's such a big deal for Paul. You know, um, yeah. is, is he is, mm -hmm. he is um, talking to a very secular crowd that says, no, justice first, mine is mine. I get to do that. And that creeps into the church and gives us, a, I think, a bad name um, that we're supposed to be, quote unquote, above that. It is better for ourselves to be wronged, to be defrauded, to suffer. Um, than it is for us to um, to instead uh, win the lawsuit but lose the friends, um, as happened in, in my case. Uh, can you think of a time uh, in which you uh, successfully, you know, let it go? Um, I think of a friend of mine who was owed money. Go ahead, Paul. I, I'm, I think he's kind of talking about what forgiveness is here, or even choose your best. Yeah. <laughs> um, in, often, in order to preserve a friendship, you've got to let go of some sort of way that your friend may have hurt you or insulted you or something. And yep. so, you know, you, mm -hmm. you give them your relationships, you give them your love and your, and in fact, even before they had a chance to apologize or atone or whatever, um, that's what forgiveness is. Um, it just, um, and in a way, choosing your own battles too. You know, what's what's more important here? Is it important that this Christian community stays together and supports each other, or that you know they focus right. on some little thing that somebody did wrong? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Which, uh, which, which may or may not be a little thing, you know, as I mentioned, you know, with the, uh, with the car. And I do wonder, um, you know, what, what are the, um, what were my influences as I went through that lawsuit? Uh, who were the people around me who were uh, saying, sue them or don't sue them? Um, what were the voices that I was listening to? Um, you know, that, that I, I think um, was a, a, big, a, a big personal lesson for me. But we're, we're to ask, you know, if you haven't been as fortunate as me and, and bought a lemon once and had to sue the dealer, um, we're, I think, asked to ask those same forgiveness questions, Paul, that you bring up. And Janet, were you going to say something? Yeah, I'm somewhat a little confused. Is he referring to existing in the world law the law that as citizens they had to go by and separating that from our beliefs our religion i'm somewhat confused by this particular um chapter mm -hmm. i mean it's hard Who to ignore to everything and that. sometimes you do need to step up but also last week he talked a lot in the past about we're not to um, we're we don't judge people. But then toward the end of the last um, chapter last week, then we are judging people because he said, get rid of those people, put them out. And so I kind of am confused going back and forth with some of these chapters. If that makes any mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. Sure, it makes a lot of sense. Who wants to take a stab at answering that? <laughs> I guess when well, are we well, supposed fronting. to judge what and when are we not supposed to judge? Yeah, hold on, Kathy, I think I heard oh, your I voice. I've lost we sound. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Well, I think it's more of a thing that you get two or three other religious people together and confront someone rather than take them to a secular court. I think that's what he's. I think that's what he's talking about. I don't know. I don't know, Paul. But he doesn't want you to ignore. Okay, Pat. Things, we, but he doesn't want you to take it to a Greek court, I guess. 
One of the things that I see in here is that we can confront and should, and we should first do it one-on-one -on -one, as James said. And if that doesn't work, then take a friend. And if that doesn't work, then you take it to the assembly and you do it within the confines of the Christian life, but it's not being a doormat. Don't let somebody just stomp all over you and then go away and say, see, I won. It's being able to stand tall and stand in God's kingdom as his servant and his ambassador. He wouldn't let anybody walk all over him. He'd confront them. I mean, we see that all the way through. I mean, he had no trouble going into the temple and clearing the tables and everything. And he even got angry with his disciples. How long am I going to be with you before you get the true message? Mm -hmm. So it's more, I see it yeah. not so much as a lawsuit, but as a confrontation within the right confines of our Christian life. Now, maybe I'm seeing that yeah. in a little naive. I don't think so, but I could be. Okay, why, but... What about why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be defrauded? I think what, uh, what Paul really Is sees, and if we get a bit into them? Annabelle. I'm sorry, what? I think what we're edging into here is a bit of uh, Quaker and Anabaptist theology, uh, where there is a big line, Janet, between the world and between the church. And Paul is very, very clear right. here that if there is a breakup, a, a breakdown, if somebody wrongs somebody, there's a trespass, somebody steals something, somebody offends somebody, if there is something that is a, a wrong that, that I think, Pat, you're exactly right, you don't, um, you, you don't just uh, pretend like there's not a wrong. You don't refuse to name it. That's not what being a Christian is. What you do is you name it because that's truth, and then you forgive it, and then you you approach it with mercy and not judgment. And what what Paul is trying, I think, trying to say is that look, you're bringing the world's idea of justice into the church, and our whole reason for being okay. is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, the liberating gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you have a you know a, a, a trespassing or you bought a lemon car. Your most important consideration is not getting your money back. Your most important consideration is how can you act as a Christian towards him, and 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 that's where I think uh, yeah. we need to uh, we need to really be considering uh, that line between the church and the world. Now, back then it was really easy. You had the church and the world. Here, if uh, if Saint David says, "Look, you know this is how we're supposed to act." And Janet goes, I don't really want to do that. You know what? There's a Presbyterian church on the street. <laughs> and you can just leave um, and, and go someplace else and be a Christian. And, and, and that's not what existed in Paul's day. Um, in Paul's day, you had one church and, and you were okay. in it, you were out. And so doing something like this became a lot easier in terms of being a united witness to Jesus um, for, the, um, for the sake of the gospel. Um, and so I, I don't think that Paul is all about, uh, about um, uh, uh, not naming a transgression or, uh, or, or, or not standing up for justice. I think it's, it's it, 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 you know, there's a saying you hear often in protests, uh, you can't have justice, you can't have peace without justice. And justice means truth, is naming it and saying, look, I was offended, but I have chosen to forgive it. I have chosen not to um, file the lawsuit. I have chosen to act or behave in such a way that's going to be forgiving, and I'd rather be defrauded or wronged than to 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 tarnish the Christian witness. Um, does that make sense? Yes. Yes. The history of it. You know what it reminds me of? Do you remember? Thank you. Sure. Kathy, go ahead. 
Well, years ago, they had that shooting at the Amish school that Marianne murdered like eight, ten little little girls. And the Amish went to yeah. his yeah. family that day or the next day. And a lot of people said, how can he do that? And he says, this is my religion. This is what we believe that, you know, God is to judge. We are to forgive. And, not, and members of their church said, you know, I'm just not ready to do that just yet. But the, for the most part, they did. Mm -hmm. But he goes, I can't have well, peace if I hold that for the most part. Right. Uh, right. I, I, True forgiveness, though, comes yeah, forgiveness when you have a, a deep issue. relationship with God. Yeah, I think that that can be certainly something that is uh, integral to it. Um, but I mean, secular people can forgive also, uh, because as, as Janet pointed out, it's in your self-interest to forgive. Um, but to, uh, um, and, and to, to forgiveness, there's a certain amount of fake it till you make it also, uh, that, that it's very difficult or can be very difficult, depending on the offense. I mean, there are $5 offenses and there are a thousand dollar fences and there are half million dollar fences that you never get over. Um, you know, somebody does something to a, right. a precious beloved person. Uh, and I'm, you know, I don't know how some people ever quote unquote, forgive them. Um, that takes a lot of stages and uh, a million revisits. How do people forgive their cell themselves? That I think is a huge deal. Um, he doesn't get it to here, but as we know, that is, that is, you know, ground zero for some say most mental illness. Is, is an inability to forgive oneself, uh, to, to live in the past and regret, to look at the future, uh, you know, negatively, um, and to forgive ourselves yes. uh, in important ways. Would that be a grieving experience that you have to go through? You know, hmm. that's a good question. Um, I mean, you know, you grieve what you lost, don't you? I mean, that's always a, you know, somebody did something to somebody. I think there's, like we started off this, this meeting, there's a huge amount of grief going on out there. Um, mm -hmm. and, and there's, and you can't really, you know, it's not like, you know, we can say, you know, let's get a lynch mob together and get that coronavirus, right? Um, it's, we, 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 we're angry at something that we, that, that you know, we, it's beyond our control and, and, Coronavirus is just doing what it's supposed to do. I mean, it's, you know, so it's a virus. It's just supposed to grow. And uh, we're doing what we're supposed to do, which is try to stop it, right? Um, but that's a good question, Pat. Uh, the, the role of grief in something like this. Um, very, very important question anyway. Um, but and, and anyway, should we, um, let's see. Uh, Paul, do you want to go ahead and read verses 9 through 11? Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm not muted. Okay. <laughs> Do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Oh boy, there's some discussion. <laughs> Do not be deceived. Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, no prostitutes, sodomites, thieves, the greedy, drunkards, revilers, robbers, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Oh boy, this is a good one. <laughs> and this is what some of you used to be. Hmm. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. Hmm. Amen. Yeah, I, I think I, I think our baptismal covenant kind of gives us a clue here because we're called to respect the dignity of every human being but we're also called to seek justice. So mm. I think we have to separate the difference between when we come to judging, <laughs> judging certain behaviors as to whether they're right or wrong, and not confusing that with the value of the person. Um, I, I, um, oh. you, you, can, you can make a judgment that what some, someone else's behavior is wrong, and you can make the judgment that I'm gonna choose not to do that. Um, but 
if you are making the, the judgment that that is an evil person, not, not worthy of my love or my care or my concern, uh, that's troublesome. <laughs> yes. Um, mm -hmm. So I think, and I, and I, that the line about <laughs> this is what you used to be. So he's yeah. probably talking to people who used to, you know, earlier in their lives were living that kind of life. But be, through the relationship with this new church and the relationship with Jesus, they were able to turn that around. So they're no longer robbers and drunkers or the, the, all the things listed there. Yeah. yeah. Because and, and you, someone saw the value in that person. Yeah, and no, and, and you, you, in spite of the fact of what they were doing. <laughs> you bring up a really important point, I think, Paul, and we've uh, we talked about this in previous uh uh, times together, and that is that Paul was talking to a church that was um, uh, that was really, um, all, you know, it was made of adult converts. You know, unlike you know the United States today, uh, Western Christians, where you know eighty five, ninety five percent of um, of believers are uh, are are baptized as an infant and uh, and come to their faith in ways that they would self describe as gradually. These are people who come to faith suddenly. These are people who were in a highly secular society. We touched on earlier in our study that, uh, you know, uh, these kinds of, uh, of behaviors as, uh, you know, fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, etc., cetera, um, were part of the rank and file and much more common than what we might see in, quote unquote, a Christian country because this would not have been a quote unquote Christian country. This, this was a highly secularized environment. And so, um, you know, Paul is, uh, is, is very right in, in describing that as this is what you once were. Uh, it is what they once were. And, uh, and, and reminding them then that that's not what you are now, okay? Um, I, I think that when we try to, you know, I, I, you know, I, I, I've used this line before that, you know, Paul's letter here is a, uh, is like a doctor's prescription. And the worst thing you can do is take somebody else's prescription, right? Is, is we need to realize that this is designed mm. for the, um, you know, the, the situation that he's diagnosing here. Um, and that is one in which this, you know, incredible secularization was, you know, quite, uh, quite profound. And so what do you have here? You have wrongdoers. What, what are they? Those are people who do wrong, right? Fornicators, we know what those are. Idolaters. I mean, that, that unfortunately is still very much with us. <laughs> you know, we, we, um, we, we unfortunately continually uh, in and outside the church put, uh, you know, put things, but stuff before God. You know, we do that all the time. And, and that, that is still very, uh, very much with this, you know, adultery, um, male prostitutes, sodomites, Thieves. There, there are. I mean, we could go um, into in, into uh, depth about what this meant at the time in terms of having um, uh, temples and temple prostitutes, and part of religion had to do with the unity, uh, physically and spiritually, uh, with God. And so you had male and female prostitutes right nearby here. Um, they've unearthed was a huge, huge uh, temple to Aphrodite, uh, the goddess of love, and. Uh, you know, it's said that there were at one time a thousand uh, uh, female prostitutes who worked outside of that temple and at night they would come into Corinth and ply their trade. Um, yeah, I've heard that trumpeted and, and disparaged among critics who look at this, uh, who look at this book. But, the, you know, there, there are certain, you know, uh, sodomites, as we know, uh, you know, we know what that is and we know we have... Uh, different ways of approaching that topic today. Thieves, the greedy, the drunkards, all those things. Um, and, and so this is one of Paul's famous lists. So Paul has in his letters a couple of times, uh, two or three, no, more than two, I think three or four times he'll have a list of, and, and, and when he names um, sodomites or homosexuals, it's been called, um, you know, there, uh, uh, there is where uh, our conservative brothers and sisters will take a stand on um, on the rights of gays and lesbians, uh, binaries, et cetera, uh, in our midst, um, non-binaries rather, uh, as being, you know, something explicitly condemned by the Bible. Um, 
it's interesting that the, the word here uh, in the NRSV is sodomites. There are other places where it's called uh, homosexuals. Uh, more, recent more recent translations will use that. Um, but sodomites tend to uh, suggest that this is a behavior that um, had a, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, had this sense of dominance to it, that there was a, an upper and there was a lower, and that one was, uh, one was worse than the other, um, and one had to do with uh, um, control over another, um, and that this was what was wrong. Certainly what's not listed in here uh, is any kind of modern contemporary understanding of, uh, of same gender attraction as we know it. And in, in what I mean by that is within the context of a loving, committed uh, Christian right. relationship. Um, that's just not here. And uh, trying to pull this into that conversation is problematic on many levels. Um, not the least of these is this translation of sodomites in some translations, homosexuals and others. Um, you know, when I, I, I want to say that this idea of sodomy and homosexuality is, is mentioned maybe a dozen times in all of scripture. It's never mentioned in a favorable light, nor is it ever mentioned in a way that comes close to equating what you and I are learning about human sexuality and especially <clears throat> what's exciting these days is the idea that our sexuality is more or less on a continuum, um, that we like to say that, well, you're either a man or a woman. But of course, we know that for every 2,000 people born uh, in, in, in the U.S., they have uh, two sets of, you know, of genitals. Um, that is very common for, uh, for <clears throat> sexual ambiguity. Um, it's it's, it's, it's the, the norm in many species. And uh, um, and ours, uh, ours it is, uh, certainly. Um, but so we, we learn more about these and we bring that to the scriptures and we look at what Paul is saying. And it's very clear in this uh, per pericope that he's, he's telling, look, you used to do this kind of stuff, but no more. Uh, verse 11, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of God. And what are all those, uh, what, is, what is everything on that list um, have in common? Well, this, these are offenses. These are offenses against your own body. These are offenses against other people. These are uh, ways of being selfish and not loving your neighbor as yourself, right? Not, not putting God first, being greedy, being a drunk, being a robber, being a thief. Um, these, are, these are ways in which we stray from God's ways. And, um, and that's what Paul's really getting to. And uh, Paul LeClaire, I want you to read the translation here from Eugene Peterson, if you don't mind. <clears throat> okay, we were on nine, right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to scroll down. Okay. You're scrolling. Don't you realize that this is not the way to live? Unjust people who don't care about God will not be joining in his kingdom. Those who use and abuse each other, use and abuse sex. Use and abuse the earth and everything in it. Don't qualify as citizens in God's kingdom. A number of you know from experience what I'm talking about. For not so long ago, you were on that list. Since then, you've been cleaned up and given a fresh start by Jesus, our Master, our Messiah, and by our God, present in us, the Spirit. Amen. Does that add a little bit of, uh, I don't want to say clarity, but certainly a little bit of light? Yeah. 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 Unjust people who don't care about God will not be joining the kingdom. Of, joining the kingdom. I mean, the kingdom is open to anybody who wants to join. Um, I mean, in Paul's, you know, in Paul's uh, um, uh, opinion, it just seems to be that, that people who, who aren't going to heaven are people who don't want to go to heaven that this is a free gift and the only thing you got to do with a gift is take it. Um, and unjust people, quote unquote, who don't care about God will, uh, will not be joining in his kingdom. And what does he mean by unjust? Well, they're, they're not, you know, they're, they're just opting out um, of, of, of the God kind of life. And why do people usually opt out? Um, shame, um, uh, <clears throat> unforgiveness, un self-unforgiveness. Self um, don't think they're worthy. <clears throat> um, 
when you give somebody, uh, you know, here's a, here's a, you know, here's a sandwich and here's, um, here's some sand, which would you rather eat? Uh, the majority of us would pick the sandwich. Um, there will always be one or two people who choose the sand. I don't know why. Um, maybe you don't choose the um, sandwich because you don't think you're worthy of it, right? Um, that I think is, is at the heart of a lot of um, what you might call you know, unbelief. And also I think the heart is that the church has not been good about interpreting the message, sharing the, the, the message in each age um, to really be so self-sacrificing and so long suffering to bring the, um, um, to bring, bring the church uh, in, in, into the new age, which is all about sacrifice and, and all about, uh, you know, ways in which we might uh, embody this amazing, amazing, you know, uh, ethic that Paul is getting into. Hey, it's better to, you know, to be wronged than to, uh, than to do wrong. I mean, that, that's, that's like, whoa, oh, wait a minute. You mean, I, I don't know if I'm right? I, I can't win? No, you can't win. You know, you're supposed to turn the other cheek. Wait a minute, he hit me. Well, you know, don't hit back. But, but he deserves it. You know, yeah, all these things. It's 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 tough. It's it's tough to be to to, to be uh, uh to, to it's tough to be a Christian. You know, it, it takes it takes power. You know, and and not power in the sense that um that um that uh, uh you know then we we always talk about this we, the world worldly power is in the sermon sunday about mother's day right your, your mom's a superhero because she has god's power and god's power is the power to forgive the power to have self-control right the power to be generous uh, these are all the powers that we when pentecost comes that's the power we're praying for you know lord give me the power to be long-suffering bring give me the power to be patient right Junior, I'm trying to be patient with you here. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, uh, but yeah, and and so uh, a number of you know from experience what I'm talking about. For not long ago, you were on that list. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's probably why he's naming it. Uh, and since then, you've been cleaned up, right? And that's I think what we what the church's continual prayer is: Lord, wash me. Lord, Lord, I, I, I you know, I'm continually getting dirty. Right? My son the other day was like, Dad, why do we have to wash the car? It's just going to get dirty again. <laughs> yeah. but it, it was meant to be clean, and you were meant to be clean. And that's why we keep falling off the horse and getting back on it. Falling off the horse and getting back on it. That's our job as Christians. Um, and, and so we're to be present in that way in the world, is to be a people who continually get back on the horse that's why naming lament is important. That's why naming unforgiveness is important. Mm. Offense is important because it um, it, it really um, it, it really gives then a tribute to the power of God. Um, God is the reason that I mean when people turn to you and say, and Pat was so nice. Pat gave me a big compliment today on some prayers that that had been written, and I, and I was like, Pat, you know, thank you so much. But it's a, but we we try to channel these things, don't we? We want to channel okay. patience. We want to channel love. We want to channel forgiveness. We want to channel channel understanding. Um, and you know, the best way I knew know to do that is in Christian community in Bible study. You know, I love these Bible studies uh, in ways in which we remind one another of who we are. Because the world's going to always try to tell you who you are. The world's going to tell you that you are, um, uh, you know, you're, you're unfit. You're 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 not good enough. You're doing it wrong. Uh, you're offensive. Mm -hmm is unforgivable uh, but that's not what the world says excuse me that's not what god says that's just what the world says um and so let's pop back here um to uh to this next pericope which is really wonderful in its own way um glorify god in body and spirit and um let's see pat do you want to read this one and and why don't you why don't we take it half and half why don't you read it through uh verse 14 Take it through from verse 14. Okay. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. And God will destroy both one and the other. The body is meant not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Go through 14. 
And God I, I, raised I, I, the Lord and will also raise up us by his power. Okay. Now, what do you think, Janet? What do you think he meant when he said, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial? Hmm. All things are lawful for me, but not things. Well, I guess I translate it to what the law is, mm -hmm. and it may not um, be best for you to follow that. Okay. But, and I realize as I'm re looking at this, I keep trying to think of it in today's terms instead of who Paul was talking to. Okay. So, um, and I guess, but I will not be dominated by anything. I guess what is learning, following the Lord and what is beneficial to you in your faith? Mm -hmm. All things are lawful for me. I don't know. I'm pondering that. Okay. Who's got could another we, take on this? Okay. Could we substitute beneficial for permissible and, um, oh, what's the other word? If, if they're, they're permissible for me to do, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean that it's going to benefit me. Yeah. Would, would that oh, be okay? Well, and I mean, what's, what, what is the foundation of all ethics? Um, Augustine famously put it this way. Uh, and he used, uh, he used um, you know, the golden rule as his foundation. Uh, <laughs> love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and body. And love, the you love your neighbor as yourself. Okay. So uh, Augustine shortened it and, and he said, love God and do anything you want. Okay, <laughs> so it's an easy ethic to remember. Love God and do anything you want. Well, if you love God, you're going to love your neighbor because that's God in the flesh, right? Yeah. And so uh, you're going to start to say, look, oh, oh, wait a minute. That means I can do anything. Yeah, yeah, do anything you want as long as it's, uh, as it's beneficial mm. to the cause of Christ, right? And being beneficial to the cause of Christ is going to mean already, you know, yeah, all things are lawful, but... I'm not going to, and then we can go back in the list, right? Uh, uh, fornicate, I, I, idolater, fornicate or idolater, mm -hmm. okay. adult, et cetera. None of those things are beneficial. None of those things. One of the things that we frequently find in terms of, of Christian law is that your life just goes better if you don't steal stuff. You know, your life just goes better if you don't <laughs> sleep with your neighbor's wife. Your life just goes better if you don't, uh, you know, uh, you know, mur murder somebody. You know, um, so so this I think is 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 Paul's way of reminding us that you know, um, uh, you know, while th the gospel gives me great um, liberty to do what I want, doesn't mean it's beneficial, and it's not going to be beneficial. Um, the the uh, uh, I, all things are lawful for me. That's in quotes also. I will not be dominated by anything. What do we know when, yeah, it's lawful. I could drink a beer. Um, for a, a small percentage of people, what does that beer drinking turn into? Mm. Yeah. Alcoholism. Yeah. Alcoholism, exactly. And then what happens? Who becomes your God? Uh, mm. You know, you, 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 and you talk to anybody who has been in the throes of, whether it be alcohol, you know, obesity, um, you know, uh, any of these 12-step programs that are set up, there are hundreds of them, um, and, and you will find that, that had, they will admit readily that that became their God. But they could not stop themselves. Um, and, and that is often the, what they call the first step, is that, you know, I have no ability to conquer this thing on my own. Um, so all things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful for me. I won't be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. And God will destroy both and the other. The body is not meant for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. So he's getting to this very Jewish idea of, of there's a purpose for everything. You know, there's a, there's a, you know, God's creation is good. Um, and, and we do well to affirm all things in God's creation, which has to do with our, you know, our, our sexuality, certainly our, our eating. Um, I mean, food, as he says, quite, you know, quite blatantly, is not a bad thing. Um, your body is not a bad thing. Um, 
and God raised the Lord and, and will also raise us by his power. Uh, that is a powerful statement because then, of course, we get into these alternative understandings of what power is. And uh, God will raise us up from whatever it is we're battling with God's power. God has the power. And you hear this testimony after testimony, and I think oh. if we think about it, we can, uh, we can find in ourselves uh, habits that we broke, habits that we started, um, you know, things that happened in our lives that really it was, God gave us power to do it. You know, God gave us the inspiration to do it. Pat, you're such an inspiration in so many ways in the ways that you pray for people and the ways that you're hopeful with people. Um, uh, oh, I have to tell you, I was at, um, uh, I was at uh, uh, a Terry Moore's funeral on Friday. Um, and uh, I, I picked up a handful of, uh, of programs for the Daughters of the King. I thought you guys would want one. Thank you. And Thank we you. Talked, and we talked about, yeah, you know, when you go to many um, uh, of funerals, I found in the African-American tradition around here, uh, they, the, the, the bulletin is a full-color, multi-photographed, you know, uh, a keepsake. And so they had a, a, a box of these, and so I grabbed some for you. Um, but this... Uh, um, this idea that that you, that you really kind of spearhead this group of of people interested in praying for others and forming community uh, is 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 got power of its own. I mean, that's God working through you. Verse, um, verse fourteen is where that ends. And I wondered, uh, Kathy Graham, would you pick up fifteen and go through eighteen? Fifteen. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Should I therefore take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that whoever is united to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is said, the two shall be one flesh. Where, where did you want me to go to? Fine. That's fine. That's okay. fine. So verse 15, uh, Paul is, is, um, is very famous for using this analogy of believers and the body. Okay. Uh, Paul will talk about how we are all members of one body, but different parts. Um, some people are, are the brain. Some people are the callus. <laughs> some people are the, uh, the earlobe. Uh, we all have different parts of the body. Uh, and in, in endemic in the human experience is that we all wish we were another part, right? <laughs> the, you know, I always think of my sister who had straight hair and all her brothers had curly hair, right? What did she want? Curly hair, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you see that your part is you know, is, is, is the, the eyeball, you want to be the ear, you know, you're the heel, you want to be the elbow or, or whatever. Um, but the idea is that um, the, the body of Christ is meant for the Lord, okay? The body of Christ is meant for the service and love of God. Uh, do you not know that uh, your bodies, and he talks, I think, more intentionally here, um, that, that we, we don't belong to ourselves anymore? but that in Christ, we belong to Jesus. Um, and, and this idea that um, we, you know, it, it's interesting because we, there is a certain piety involved in, in, in Christianity. And um, the conservatives tend to be the more pious, the liberals tend, tend to be the more, you know, kind of social justice oriented. So they're not so much worried about drinking and sleeping around, but they're really worried about minimum wage and about, you know, Black, uh, black Lives Matter. Um, and, and the lament, I think, among a lot of Christians has always been, can't we have them both? <laughs> you know, can't we have people who are really concerned about, um, you know, about living a, a sober life, sober in the, in, the, in the good sense that you're serious and you're single-minded on the things of God. Um, and, and that, uh, be, because that is a witness, you know, that is a witness. And that's, that's the whole idea of the beginning of this chapter is your desire to put the, um, uh, uh, <coughs> the, the relationship above the thing, right? It's better to suffer the wrong than to do the wrong, um, is, is kind of at the heart of that. So should I therefore take the members of Christ and make the members of a prostitute? No, never. Um, so don't, you know, so, so there's, the, there's the, the literal sense of that, but there's also the metaphorical sense. Uh, what does it mean to sell ourselves out, to, um, to go after something cheap, to harm somebody? Um, I, I mean, I'm sure there are prostitutes that, that you know, 
willingly work at the Mustang Ranch or something like that. But the vast majority, when I worked as a reporter and I was, you know, I, I would be around and with prostitutes, don't do this thing because they want to. Um, they're poor, they're addicted to drugs. They're, in this case, in, in, in back in the first uh, century, uh, many times it was the sense that you did not have any other source of income. Your husband had died, your, um, you know, you, you had nobody to take care of you. And that's, that's kind of what you did. It's not, it's not that, um, I mean, I'd be open to other people's understandings of this. I, I was, I often speak from a naive understanding here, um, but that this, uh, this is not a profession that is chosen by a lot of people on purpose, right? They don't grow up as a kid and say, this is what I want to do. Um, and so Paul is very keen about both literally and metaphorically talking about what that entails here to, uh, um, to, to take care and to safeguard your body and what goes into it. Um, and then uh, you, any other comments on this, on these lines? I have a question. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the body, but mm -hmm. also I keep coming back to it's how the brain is infected and the thoughts that come forth and why often we do the things we shouldn't do when we know there are things that we should be doing. Mm -hmm. So by, is it by association? Is it by understanding the, what is good, what isn't? Um, and the, the mind affecting how the body or the whole person reacts to a situation. Mm. I guess it's more of a psychological question, but I'm not sure. Who wants to take a stab at responding to that? <laughs> so. Well, I think it kind of goes along with, you know, the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. I mean, it's, you make good intentions, but you don't always follow through on them. I mean, you really need to be disciplined to do that, I think. Yeah. But I think it's one of those things, once you develop habits, it's easier to do. But breaking old habits to make new ones is not a simple task. Right. Uh, or fighting back. Um, you know, we all have different urges in our lives. Um, sexual urge is the one that's obviously on the table here. But the idea is we always, we have all kinds of, I mean, who hasn't walked to the edge of the Grand Canyon and thought, hmm, I wonder what it'd be like to jump off. You know, I mean, we, we, we have urges to, you know, boy, that third piece of cake looks good. Or, you know, um, what is what is Jake Jones's famous line? If it feels good to say, don't say it. You know, <laughs> right? Because it's probably you put the person in their place and you wish you hadn't said it. Um, but but there are urges that we face every single day, um, and they usually have to do with preferring our own comfort, preferring our own security, pre preferring our own convenience. Then they do about um, about what. I, I think Paul is really getting to the heart of when he talks about these uh, uh, these fleshly things. It's get your mind off yourself. Yes, you have urges. Yes, you have thoughts. Yes, you have um, quote unquote temptations. But what we're asked to do is live a godly life, and that takes a sober, you know, uh, concentration on the other, on the other. How can I help the other? How can I lift them up in my life? Um, so, so yeah. I, I mean, I, I think uh, I think that's a good that's a good point, Kathy. Do you, um, Paul? Do you you did such a good job? Or um, why don't we call on you, Janet? Janet, do you want to do um, sixteen through the end? Okay. Do you not know that whoever is united to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is said, the two shall be one flesh. But anyone united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Shun forn fornication. Every sin that a person commits is outside the body. The fornicator sins against the body itself. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you were brought with a price. For you were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Amen. Yes. Mm -hmm. What does that say to people? 
It says our responsibility is with our commitment to take care of ourselves. And while things, as Pat said, are might be permissible, it may not be the best thing to do for yourself. And just uh, your body is your temple and take care of it. Yeah. Something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's interesting by that uniting. Uh, you know, yeah. And what, uh, what do you think he means by that? That you become associated with, you become one of what you associate with. I like that terminology. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. If you um, partake, participate in that, you are, um, you know, you're condoning that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Would healthy be part of this? Uh, if you're doing something that you know maybe inside is not what you should be doing, but you do it anyway, you have an unhealthy feeling about yourself. Would that be part of it? Oh. Yeah, I mean, how healthy? Um, I like that sense of association that you are going to be, uh, you're going to be one in the same uh, in terms of, of, of condoning that. Um, you're going to be in agreement with that for the two shall be one flesh, right? Um, the two shall be in agreement. And, and, and that's essentially what marriage is about, right? You're, you're in agreement with, uh, this guy wants to be rescued here, excuse me. Here you go, buddy. Here you go. He likes to climb up on things. He's a little monkey. Uh, <laughs> but anyone united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. And so there's the union that we're looking for, right? Mm -hmm. Shun fornication, which essentially is the, is the, uh, um, the I don't want to say unlawful, but certainly the, the un, um, undesirable union, uh, mm -hmm. the, the incorrect unions out there. And every sin the person commits is outside the body, but you are sinning against the body uh, by uniting in ways that you're not supposed to, and that are not life-giving. Um, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? What's that mean to folks? Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Christ comes to live within us. Therefore, the Holy Spirit is, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Holy Spirit is within you. Um, what, what does that image conjure up for people? Strength for me. Mm -hmm. If I go back and say, yeah, you know, the Holy Spirit's within you. What are you doing that you shouldn't be doing? Mm. I don't always do that, but I do know I should. <laughs> mm hmm, mm -hmm. <clears throat> Yeah, it's it's part of to that idea that you know you're redeemed through through God dying on a cross. So if He paid that ultimate price, well, I guess you own big time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love, and, and, I love it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, He gave you quote, quote unquote He gave you eternal life. Right. And, you know mm -hmm. what is eternal life, and that is that we can know God. Um, you know, I, I think many times we think that, oh, heaven is a place where, uh, you know, that heaven has got to be, uh, more, um, uh, more profound than we think it is when heaven can just be being in a peaceful place, you know, that mm. is so important to be in that peaceful place. Yeah. Um, Holy Spirit gives you hope too. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's God in you. It's God in you. For do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you? Wow. I mean, it's not like it's the house of the Holy Spirit, right? Um, <laughs> you know, it's it's this idea that this is, you know, and what is a temple? It's a place of worship, right? Place of reverence. It's holy. It's sacred. It's set apart. Um, you know, many, many times, like when I'm praying or whatever, and I sense the, the voice of the Lord coming, 
um, that voice is often telling me I'm better than I thought I was. Mm -hmm. I'm more okay than I thought I was. Um, I was reading an article this week, maybe I'll put it in a sermon Sunday. Um, and it was, it, was, uh, it was written by a guy who is, well, it was a review of a book. And the guy really takes on this idea that, you know what, we are not, you know, <coughs> we're, not, we're not evil at birth. I mean, it was, it, 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 it's something that you've heard me talk about before that has to do with um, the, the, the good nature that um, is in all of us and that because, and it's because God is in us, because God made us and committed and, and, and called us good. That's why we're good, not anything that we've done. Uh, we do the opposite actually. Um, and, and he was bringing up some cases and some stories about this in, uh, that was written in this, in this book review. But the idea is that in light of COVID-19, you and I are seeing a lot of charity pouring out, mm -hmm. you know? Um, that, you know, it's funny to me that you go to our pantry and you've got almost as many people bringing food as you have people needing food, you know, um, you have a whole lot of people volunteering and people, you know, very concerned about how the least among us is doing. Um, and so I think your body is the temple, uh, which you have from God and it's not your own. Hmm. That's an interesting way to put it, right? Hmm. That you're mm -hmm. not your own, right? Um, I'm going to get the gallery view. I have a feeling we've got a, a meeting coming up at 11, and it's about two minutes to, and I want to <laughs> make sure there's people pop in. They know we're here. Uh, anyway, so uh, interesting chapter, huh? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes. Not any. Not any. Letting me sit in your Bible study today. <laughs> well, Paul, thank you for coming, and you are always welcome. Um, you know, we we were talking uh, the other day and uh, about I was talking with Heather Barda, who's the rector up in Clarkston, and um, and we thought, you know, because we're all doing virtual church, I wonder what it be, would be like to pull together a couple congregations for a service. Huh. You know, and to maybe get St. Patrick's to come over and to. to um, uh, to come together with Heather. I, I can't say come over because it's not like <laughs> we're, we're, you know, we're making the drive. But when it's virtual, you know, I think it would be too much if we got together with like six churches. But it, I mean, it might be kind of fun. What do you guys think of that? Yeah, that's an interesting idea. Sure. Yeah. yeah. It would be interesting to to join with others, especially when we can see some of them. And maybe we have friends at these other churches. Yeah, um, the one in Clarkston is actually my um, uh, my brother-in-law and sister-in-law founded that. Oh, did they really? Yes. Oh my! We're part of the uh, founding body, mm -hmm. and it is really a nice, nice group of people. Yeah, yeah. Well, my goodness. Uh, well, um, the. Uh, uh, we'll continue to talk about that and let people know. Kitty, what do you think about that? Sure, I'm willing to try anything. Yeah. Well, we were specifically thinking about maybe Pentecost, you know, I mean, because oh, that, yeah. 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 Oh, you know, that's coming up at the end of the month and would give us some time to kind of plan. And uh, and it might be good, Paul, if we did something like that, if if we had, if we could prepare something like for Mother's Day with Kitty when we just did that Mother's Day thing. Right. Uh, Right. For people to, you know, answer the question, you know, what does the Holy Spirit mean to you? And people to 10 seconds or less, you know, mention that. And then get people from different congregations to mention that. To Put together that. a three-minute thing. But uh, anyway. I think it would create a, a closer community within the Episcopal Church. 